I'm Michael Riley, and I'm Luke Hartnett. On this edition of Game Ball College Kickoff, we're going to talk about the recap of what happened Championship Conference weekend, and we're also going to talk about the final four teams that's in the college football playoff. Also, we're going to get into the coaching carousel, and also we're going to do a prediction of Army versus Navy. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned right here, only on Game Ball College Football Podcast starts now. What's happening, everyone? Welcome to Game Ball College Kickoff Podcast, where the football season never ends. We're going to get into the recap of Conference Championship Weekend, also get into the final four teams of the college football playoff. And there's been a lot of coaching carousel going on. Coaches fired, coaches hired, coaches still available. And the last segment, we're going to get into the matchup and prediction of Army versus Navy. So let's get started. With the Big 12 Championship recap, TCU versus Oklahoma. Oklahoma will smack TCU around 41 to 17. Ouch. Kenny Hill, 27 to 37, 234 yards, two TDs, one INT. Kenny Hill, 13 rushes, 51 yards. John Dursa, five catches, 66 yards, one TD. Total offense, 317 yards with 21st downs. Time of possession, 24 minutes, 41 seconds with two turnovers. Defense, one sack, one tackle for loss, zero turnovers. Baker Mayfield, 15-23, 243 yards, four TDs. Rodney Anderson, 24 rushes for 93 yards. Marquise Brown, Five, no, excuse me, three catches for 87 yards, one TD. Total offense, 461 yards with 22 first downs. Time of possession, 35 minutes, 19 seconds with two turnovers. Defense, one sack, six tackles for loss, one INT, one fumble recovery. So what you think about this game? Uh, TCU, uh, after getting off to a bad start, somewhat recovered. They had it to 24-17 in the third quarter. Oklahoma just pulled away. That's a team that's firing on all cylinders right now. Uh, sad part is I literally do think that TCU is the second best team in the conference, and they uh, still were no match. Well, Oklahoma, after the first few weeks of the season, and with that uh, loss to Iowa State at home, they finally found a way to click on all cylinders. Office is doing great. Defense continued to get a lot better and make key stops. And special teams also continue to make plays. You got the official running game going with Watney Anderson, the complimentary, the passing game, which is a well balanced offense. That is a good success, a recipe to where defense is down. And that's what Oklahoma did. And TCU, I don't know what happened in the first uh, few parts of the second half. They was close at one point, uh, and then they let it get away and got blown out of the waters by Oklahoma. Offense was under pressure all game long, and defense really couldn't stop them. They was outmatched and outgunned by Oklahoma's offense, so you have to give it up for Oklahoma's offense. Find a way to expose their weaknesses on the offense and defensive side of all. So that's what won them this game. So what was your intake about TCU? Uh, like I said, I still think they're the second best team in the conference. Uh, you look at the Big 12, and uh, that conference has the uh, the biggest gap, I think, of any conference, and uh, at least of any Power 5 conference between the uh, the number one team and the number two team, and it showed Saturday. Hell, it showed both matchups against TCU this year. 
I agree. Okay, next matchup we're going to talk about is Georgia versus Auburn. Georgia will avenge their loss against Auburn with a score of 28 to 7. Jake Farm, 16 of 22 attempts for 183 yards, two TDs. DeAndre Swift, seven rushes, 88 yards for one TD. McCole Harmon, four catches, 67 yards. Total offense, 421 yards with 20 first downs. Time of possession, 33 minutes, two seconds with zero turnovers. Defense, three sacks, seven tackles for loss, and two forced fumbles. And two fumble recoveries as well. Jared Stenham, 16-32, above 45, one TD. Carry on Johnson, 13 rushes for 44 yards. Ryan Davis, 7 catches for 65 yards. Total offense, 259 yards with 18 first downs. Time of possession, 26 minutes, 58 seconds with 2 turnovers. Defense, 2 sacks, 4 tackles for loss. How was Georgia able to avenge a loss against Auburn to win the SEC championship? Uh, looked like Auburn was going to be able to pull away from them. They uh, had the ball inside the Georgia 20-yard line, up 7 nothing. Third and uh, I think it's third and six. Stidham drops back, gets hit, fumbles the ball. Georgia recovers. Um, five, seven, eight plays later, tie game. Um, you have to think of Auburn gets that. Even if they get a field goal there to go up 10 nothing after that 40 to 17, because you know SmackDown they laid on in the first matchup this year, they'd have a double-digit lead. It was still the first half. They would have planted that seed of doubt. That fumble changed absolutely everything. Yeah, that was the momentum changer, and that's what Georgia needed. They needed to turn over a big play on defense, and that's what they got. They fed off that and never looked back. Offense kept rolling. They ain't do anything fancy. They ain't doing anything to beat themselves. They had a well-executed game plan. Defense stepped up big this time against Auburn because last time, they gave over 100 yards rushing, but this time they kept carry on Johnson in check, but it didn't help. He was injured as well, playing through injuries. But still, Georgia found a way to stop Auburn's running game and make them a one-dimensional offense, which was a pass attack, and that intentionally failed, and Georgia was able to take advantage of it. Offense, defense, special teams, they were very successful. Auburn was on the drive to score a field goal or touchdown, as you mentioned, but that fumble kind of shook them, and Auburn was not able to recover, don't you think? Uh, I think they, because that, that, that fumble combined with the touchdown and the you know, ensuing touchdown, uh, I think that planted that seed of down to Auburn. And, uh, I think they could tell after that game was 7-7 that it wasn't going to be the same as last time when it was uh, easily shaping up to be that way. And uh, as soon as they got that momentum, Georgia, that is, they, they just never looked back. I agree. So Georgia had a well game plan, well executed. This is the first time in a long time that Georgia has finally won the SEC championship. This is a long time in the wait. It's their time. They earned it. They deserved it. And they're in the college football playoff for that. All right, matchup we're going to recap is Miami versus Clemson. Clemson will beat the Branks off of Miami to score a 38-3. I did not see that coming. Kelly Bryant, 23 of 29, 252 yards with one TD. Travis Alente, Alente, how do you say his name? Six rushes for 24 yards, one TD. Ray Ray McLeod, six catches for 100 yards. Total offense, 331 yards with 18 first downs. Time of possession, 34 minutes, six seconds, and one turnover. Defense, four sacks, six tackles for loss, two INTs. One fumble recovery. That's balling for a defense. Miami. Malik Rozier. 14 of 29. 110 yards. Two INTs. DJ Dallas. Six rushes for 44 yards. Baxter. Excuse me. Braxton Berrios. Seven catches for 51 yards. Total offense. 214 yards with 10 first downs. Time of possession. 25 minutes. 54 seconds with three turnovers. Defense. Four sacks, ten tackles for loss, and one fumble recovery. Break down this game. Uh, I, I didn't see 38 to three coming. I, I thought it was going to be close to that, though. Me neither. Um, Clemson. You, this is this is the first time they played Miami since 2015. 
Uh, last two, say, you know, you can, including that game, the last two times they played head to head, Clemson has won by a score of 96 to three. Uh, you might remember Al Golden's last uh, last game as coach at Miami. They fired him the day after was that 58 nothing Orange Bowl loss to Clemson. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as the head to head matchup goes, not not a whole lot's changed since then. And uh, the thing that impressed me the most about Clemson is uh, they took advantage of turnovers. They took advantage of the red zone. They uh, they didn't settle for field goals. They they capitalized on every possession they had. What Clemson did was take a page off what Pittsburgh did to Miami and expose their weakness even more against their defense because Clemson's offense was rolling. <clears throat> Keller Bryant was damn near perfect in the passing attention. He kept it simple and he took what the defense gave him, let the playmakers make the plays and miss tackles out of open field, and that's how they score their points. And defense is just clicking on all cylinders at the right time. This might be one of the best defenses in the country, don't you think? Uh, it's been uh, rumored to be one of the better defenses in the country all year, yes. Because their defense is well coached by one of the best defensive coordinators of the game, which is Vanderbilt. He gets the players coaching sound fundamental football. I love they tackle in space. They preach about tackling. They do not give up big plays. They keep everything in front of them. And their defensive backs plays to the ball. What well, I mean playing to the ball is not go face guarding like this. What they do is they turn back and play to the ball, get a turnover. You hardly don't see teams do that anymore. And the coaching staff teaches their players to do that. Fundamental football, so I think this is why they're the most successful defense in the country because they do that. With Miami, they just looked at pitiful the last two weeks. Their offense has been depleted and got exposed, giving up too many turnovers and making too many mistakes. Defenses, we're not seeing the turnover chain game like we once saw the first few games. So the last two weeks on defense, they've been exposed. So what's been the biggest issue with Miami's defense so far? Uh, I don't want to call them frauds, but I mean they uh, they they had their one shining moment against Notre Dame. That was the it was almost impossible for it to get any better from that point going forward. That was the crescendo of their season. They had Notre Dame, national TV. I believe Notre Dame just had the one loss to Georgia coming in there. Miami was undefeated. They won, what was it, 41-8 to eight or whatever. It, it, that, that was their high point. It, there's no way it could have gotten any better than that for them. Oh, I agree with that. Next matchup we're going to get to is the Big Ten Championship with Ohio State versus Wisconsin. Ohio State would defeat Previous undefeated Wisconsin of the close game score of 27-21. JT Barry, 211 yards, two TDs, two INTs. J.K. Dobbins, 17 rushes, a buck 74. Terrence McLaurin, two catches for 94 yards. Total offense with 449 yards for 16 first downs. Time of possession, 25 minutes, 54 seconds with three turnovers. Defense, three sacks. Five tackles were lost, two INTs. Alex Hornibick, 13-28, 229 yards, two INTs. Jonathan Taylor, 15 rushes, 41 yards. Danny Davis the third, three catches, 50 yards. Total offense, 298 yards with 16 first downs. Time of possession, 34 minutes, 6 seconds with two turnovers. Defense, zero sacks, two tackles were lost, two INTs. What happened in this game? Uh, I'm really surprised, uh, or not just surprised, but very impressed with Ohio State's defense. Um, Wisconsin's offense only generated uh, three true points. They uh, 18 points off the three Buckeye turnovers. Uh, the 18 points he got a successful two point conversion in there. Um, but the uh, again, the Wisconsin offense could only uh, manufacture one scoring drive without the uh, benefit of a defensive turnover. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin, they are a physical team. But they ran to Ohio State, the team that has speed. Mm -hmm. And speed beat the physicality of Wisconsin. Offensive-wise for Ohio State, they was able to expose them with deep passes in the passing game. Catching off guard with, uh, I think it was 80 yards, a 70-yard bomb. Then he had a 54-yard touchdown play. Then he had running plays with uh, Davis going left and right. JT Berry was calm and cool until he had those two turnovers that could have cost him the game. But overall, at the end, Ohio State was able to make plays 
on defense to win that game. So that's why they are the Big Ten champions, and that's why they did what they did to win this game. Wisconsin, man, you just kind of feel bad for them because all that hard work they put into it, and they didn't get the chip of the Big Ten. So what had happened was Hornetbrick was missing open players for easy throws. I was just watching the game. He had a guy open that could have been a walking touchdown. That could have been a momentum of a game. Mm -hmm. But that pass rush got to him and, and missed him by this much. The receiver couldn't adjust to make the catch for it. And he missed another wide open player, which was a screen pass. That could have green grass, could have been a big game or a touchdown. But Wisconsin's defense just got torched. They got gassed, and they was on their heels because Ohio State was taking advantage of them with chunk plays and another chunk plays. That's how you wear a defensive out, catch them off guard and get them on their heels. So that's what Wisconsin got beat by, and Ohio State did a better job at that. So congratulations to Ohio State to win the Big Ten Championship. And that will do it for the first part of this segment. When we come back, we're going to talk about the 14 college football playoff. Did the committee get it right? And it's about to get real. So don't go anywhere. Right here, only on Game Ball College Kickoff Podcast, where the football season never ends. What's happening, everyone? Welcome back to Game Ball College Kickoff Podcast, where the football season never ends. Segment two, we're going again to the final four of the college football playoff. Here's the teams that are in, and here's the matchups. Clemson versus Alabama. Georgia versus Oklahoma. Did the playoff committee get it right? Uh, I think so. I mean, it's the fourth year to play off. We've had exactly zero two loss teams in there. Um, it's they, they've been saying from year one the idea is to get the four best teams in there. Uh, they, they, these are the four, the four four best teams in college football this year. I, I think there's a considerable drop off between number four and number five. Actually, that's it's, it's, it's a clear cut top four. I say no. They didn't get it right. They got it wrong. No disrespect to Alabama. But they did not win their conference. And you look at schedule-wise, they had a weaker schedule than Ohio State. The Ohio State's downfall was that terrible loss against Iowa on the road by 31 points. Yes, that had to, something to do with it, and that hurt them really bad. But overall, Ohio State had the harder schedule than Alabama because Ohio State had Penn State and beat them. Michigan and beat them. Michigan State and beat them. Another hard team and beat them. And they beat Wisconsin for the Big Ten Championship who was undefeated. So in my opinion, it's not fair to them by winning their conference they don't get to play in that 14 playoff. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's biased. And it's always politics. Maybe it's the reputation of Alabama. Maybe they just want better ratings or something like that. I don't know. Maybe the committee's scared to put Ohio State in. You never know. That could be a Cinderella story win. Who knows what would have happened if Ohio State wins in there. But in my opinion, they got it wrong. And Ohio State was robbed out of the big, excuse me, out of the 14 playoff. The Big Ten once again, got robbed out of the playoffs. Last year, Penn State got robbed and Ohio State shouldn't have been in there. This year, Ohio State gets robbed and Alabama should not even be in that 
equation because they did not win their conference. I understand that they're the best team and they only have one loss, but in my opinion, they didn't win. And would it be fair to say they need to go to an 18 playoff instead of a 14 playoff? I think it's good to a 15 playoff. Let Alabama and Ohio State play each other this Saturday. That's Make it the ABC primetime game. That's <laughs> that's a good point there. <laughs> and I took the time to make it fair that let's just say if it was an 18 player, let's just say I had a time to draw on this sport. Okay, right here we have an 18 playoff. Let's just say for shits and giggles. At 18 playoff, I had a time to draw out. First week of the college football playoffs, excuse me, before I go all that, let's say all the four major conferences win the big championship and you have that one lost team, be the fifth place team. They're in, and outside of the Power Five, you have other conferences who won with the best record. Whoever wins with the best record gets in. So this is how I'm going to do it. First week, of the college football playoff after Heisman Awards, Sports Awards, and Individual Awards, uh, all this other stuff. First, after that, let's go first week of the playoffs. Let's go with fifth seed versus seventh seed. Let's just say Alabama's number fifth seed. And you have sixth seed versus number eight seed. So let's just go ahead and let's just say, for example, fifth seed wins. So that would be. S E C team that would be Alabama and six versus eight. So you say, let's just say the sixth spot, the six C team, and you have the other two teams have a first round bye, so they get a rest, and you have the first two teams uh, automatically gets weeks rest. If you're the top two teams. You automatically get a week's rest in the 18 football playoff. So then we got, let's just say the fourth spot is the Big Ten. And the third spot is the SEC uh, Georgia. So now you got these two teams playing. Let's just say the six SEC team beats the crap out of the six C team. So we're going to SEC here. Then you got Alabama versus Big Ten, which is Ohio State. So let's just say, for example, Alabama beats Ohio State since they're in. So we're going to SEC team right here. And then now you got your top four. You got. Oklahoma versus Georgia out of the SEC, the Big 12 versus SEC. Then you got Clemson out of the ACC versus Alabama, the SEC. So let's just say hypothetically Clemson is the better team and they beat uh, and they beat Alabama. So I'm going to circle them and go with the ACC. They won. And you got to go over here, SEC versus Big 12. I'm going to say Georgia wins that matchup. So it would be SEC right here versus the ACC. And that national championship game. So now I'm going to go down here and let's just say Clemson beats uh, Georgia by three points. ACC wins the national championship. Clemson is the repeat. And that's how you saw your 18 playoff. It needs to expand to eight teams, so it'll be fair for everybody. So committee, whatever you got to do, what you got to whoever is out there, use my formula, the eight-team playoff college football tournament. That's the strategy you should use to make it fair for everybody. My case is closed. What did you think about that? Uh, I think in due time it will expand to eight, but you got to remember they have that TV contract that goes to like uh – 2024, 2025. So it's a it's a good idea for the time being, but until they uh, at least you know uh, until the TV contract runs up or they renegotiate it, we're not going to see it. So it's all it's all hyperbole at this point. Well, whatever contracts got renewed got to be broken a little bit. 
Just expand to an 18 team playoff, please. So it can be fair for anybody. Excuse me, not anybody. It can be fair for everybody. And we won't be having this debacle chaos conversation of who she be in, who should not be in. That will do it for this segment. And when we come back, we're going to get into the coaching carousel. So don't go anywhere. Right here on, on Game Bar, College Kickoff Podcast, where the football season never ends. What's happening, everyone? Welcome back to Game Ball College Kickoff Podcast where the football season never ends. Next segment we're going to get into is the coaching carousel. Who's been fired, who's still available, and who needs to go. So for the coaches who've been fired are Todd Graham, Arizona State. Overall, coaching there, 46-31. and 31. Mike Riley from Nebraska, 19-19. Texas A&M, Kevin Sumlin, 51-26. His career there. Gary Aronson, Oregon State, 7-23. Yeah, he need to go. Jim McAllen, how do you say his name? 22-12. Two SEC Championships East, and he was fired. Jim Moore, Jr., UCLA, his time there, 47-30. I thought it was pretty decent. Butch Jones, 34-27 as Tennessee coach. <clears throat> Brent Belima, 29-34 as an Arkansas coach of his coaching tenure there. The coaches that have been hired. Chip Kelly, UCLA, former Oregon coach, 46-7. He was also the NFL coach for the Eagles and the 49ers, but he didn't do too well there. Part-time commentator, recently hired by UCLA. Dan Mullen. He's now the coach of the Florida Gators, former coach of Mississippi State. His record there was 69-46. That's pretty good. Mississippi State, Joe Moorhead. He's a former offensive coordinator for Penn State. Led that high-flying offense to points. Congratulations to him. Then you got Oregon State, Jonathan Smith, offensive coordinator at Washington. Texas A&M, Jimbo Fisher, former head coach of Florida State Seminoles. 83 and 23 there. Also, he's a national champion. Scott Frost, Nebraska, former head coach of UCF. His time there was 17 and 7. This year led him to a 12 and 0 undefeated season. Back to his R. Myers. So congratulations to him. Arizona State hired Herm Edwards, former NFL head coach and also an ESPN commentator. So he is now the Arizona State. Head coach Josh Hupo, former UCF, no, excuse me, not former. He's hired as a UCF coach, former Missouri's offensive coordinator, led that high power scoring offense. <coughs> Willie Tucker is now a former, uh, excuse me, he's a Florida State head coach. He's a former Oregon head coach, led to a 75 season bowl game. Now he's back in his home state of Florida. He grew up as a Seminoles fan, and this is a dream top for him. Let's see how he does it there. Chad Morris, Arkansas coach, former SMU coach, 14-22 and record there. Build that program for the ground up, so he landed a job at Arkansas. Jeremy Peru, Tennessee head coach recently, former Alabama's defensive coordinator, also, he's the former defensive bats coach for Florida State and Georgia. Coaches that are still available are Kevin Sumlin. He's unemployed. Overall coaching record, 86-43. and 43. Jim Moore, Jr., unemployed, 
Dan Doreen, North Carolina State head coach. Doug Meacham, the offensive coordinator of Kansas. <coughs> Mike Leach, Washington State head coach. Ed Warner, offensive coordinator slash offensive line coach of Minnesota. Mike Norville, Memphis head coach, but likely he's signed his contract extension, so he's out of the equation. Jim McAwan, he's a former Florida coach, led the two SEC East Championship. He's available. And Mike Diaz, Miami's defensive coordinator. I'm a huge fan of him. And he led that defense to turnovers and got that swagger back, except for the last two games. Brent Belima, unemployed, former Arkansas coach, overall coaching record 97-58. Jim Foutine, head coach, Virginia Tech 19-7. He's still there, but there's a possibility he could go elsewhere if he gets fired up uh, with a coaching job at other universities. Les Miles, unemployed, LSU, former LSU coach. He was 114-34 there overall as a coach. 141 wins for 55 losses, and he's still unemployed. Dave Aranata, defensive coordinator of LSU. Graciano, defensive coordinator of Ohio State. He is former Tampa Bay Buccaneers head coach and former Rutgers head coach of 67 excuse me, 68-67 as a Rutgers head coach. And the coaches that needed to go. Rich Rodriguez, Arizona State, 43-34 overall, 163-118. That's a good win, but it's time for a change there. Levy Smith for Illinois, 5-19 his team there. Cliff Kingsbury, 6-6 this year overall, 30-32. Barry Olin, Missouri coach, 7-5 overall, 11-13. There might be some changes there. Mark Stoops, coach of Kentucky, 7-5 this year. And Chris Ash, Rutgers head coach, 4-8 overall, 6-18. That's not good. Steve... I can't pronounce his last name. I'll say he's the Boston head coach of Boston College. 7-5 overall, 31-32. There could be some changes there. Larry Fedora, North Carolina's head coach. He's 3-9 this season. Overall, as a head coach, 77-53. Tony Sanchez of UNLV, 5-7 this year, 12-24. So the possibility he could keep his job. And last but not least, David Beatty, Kansas University. Overall, three years, three and thirty-three. That is unacceptable. So, who do you think who hit the home run of coaches being hired? Uh, I mean, Nebraska they're getting Scott Frost there. He's uh, he's got that track record of undefeated seasons. He uh, was undefeated as a quarterback at Nebraska in uh, 1997. Uh, he is uh, undefeated, at least in a regular season, as an offensive coordinator of Oregon the uh, year they lost to, uh, I believe, Ohio State the championship. And uh, he's, uh, you know, currently this year as a head coach at Central Florida, undefeated there as well. Uh, dude just, you know, no matter if he's playing or coaching or coordinating, he's winning. I agree. It was his time to get a better gig. And a couple of years ago, UCF was 0-12. When he took over that program, they got their first six wins, which was bowl eligible, and this year they're undefeated. I mean, he has turned his team around. He has that old screw background, and that's what you want, and he's a younger coach, and he can relate to the players as well, and you give them the player there at their best, and you see it at the UCF versus Memphis game. They gave all they got, and they came up big at the end. It was emotional for him to win but he was leaving to become a Nebraska coach and also uh, what do you think about Jimbo Fisher going to Texas now you know I'm surprised it's signed him to a 10 year deal you don't see that very often right there I mean the big contract you kind of do but uh, 10 years that's a long time yeah that is a long time a lot of money and this season it was some speculation where he was not interested in Florida State anymore I mean, my opinion, I would have left, wouldn't left, because you got the probably the best athletes in the state of Florida that I can play, and you're competing with Miami, 
UCF, South Florida, and other schools to get that recruiting, and you do a damn good job at getting good players to come to Florida State. Why would you leave that? And also, you won a national championship. And another good hire by me was, uh, excuse me, what do you think about Alabama's defensive coordinator going to Tennessee? Uh, I, I, I mean, Tennessee couldn't have botched that coach's search any more than they could have, possibly could have. I mean, it was a uh, glad I'm not a Tennessee fan, so I can just kind of sit back and laugh at all that because I mean, even, even if you, I am a Tennessee fan, I, I, if I wasn't laughing, I'd be crying. It was just, I mean, it was how to botch a coaching search one on one, and I'm not sure why this defensive coordinator wants to take on Nick Saban. Every, you know, once a year, every year, it's a. Uh, it's going to be an uphill climb, that's for sure. What do you think about Florida hiring Dan Mullen from Mississippi State? Great successor as a coordinator. I believe he was a, a part of Urban Meyer's staff at the time when he took the Mississippi State job. If I'm not mistaken, uh, his uh, first or second year at Mississippi State, they went to the swamp and beat an Urban Meyer coach team. That's, that's going to be a good fit for Florida. I like the hire by Florida because they need a quarterback. And Dan Mullen can get you a quarterback. That's what they was missing. I think they could compete to win some games and win the SEC Eats and possibly compete to win the SEC Championship. So they got the defense and the offensive talent is there. They just need a quarterback. What about Chip Kelly and UCLA? Is not this a match made in heaven? Uh, you think, you'd like to think so. Uh, he's all that uh, success he had in the Pac-12. Uh, my opinion, I think it's uh, you know easier to uh, recruit to... Um, UCLA there that is the Oregon. Uh, speaking of Oregon, I think they got a good hire as well. Mario Cristobal, he uh, did. A, he was a head coach at Florida, uh, Florida International. Did get them uh, up to this point, uh, Florida International's only bowl win in uh, school history. I agree. Uh, it could be fool's go, but Chip Kelly knows what he's doing. And he recruits out of the California area so well, and he can get Texas players to come to play for him as well. And was all his success there. He runs the program that he wants to run, and in my opinion, he's a college coach, not an NFL, just to be that clear, and he could get players by into that system, and we can get that fast tempo offense, and he can get defensive players, which UCLA is lacking. So, overall, this was another good hire. Much easier division, too. You don't have Washington, Washington State, Oregon to go through, and Stanford as well in the north. Exactly. You're basically you're basically looking at UCLA, or excuse me, USC, and on a given year, maybe Utah. I agree. What about Florida State hiring Target from Oregon? Uh, he uh, he has Florida State ties. I uh, he was either uh, I believe he played for Florida State back in the '90s. I think I overheard that the other day on the radio. But uh, he's uh, uh, another thing they were saying. This is only the second time in like 40 some odd years Florida State's been open. He had to take it. I agree. This is the perfect timing. You're back at your home state where you grew up as a fan. Excuse me, fan. You play there as a player, and one day you just hope to get a dream coaching job at University of Florida State, and he got it. So what can he do? What can he impact on this Florida State, and how can he can recruit there? Well, they have Francois back at quarterback next year, presumably healthy, and that's going to make a big difference this year. Florida State won six games this year with him, basically up for the whole season. Um, and they probably uh, they probably won eight or nine games if he's even with a healthy Francois in there. I agree. And he also has some old school background. He's a motivator, and he could get kids to play at their best. So I think this is a good fit for him. We'll see how it goes, but he's home as home state of Florida. What about Chad Morris going to Arkansas from SMU? Uh, that's a good, not great hire. Um, I think Arkansas maybe could have done better than that. Uh, there was rumors that Petrino maybe would have gone back there a second time. Of course, he kind of had the whole thing with the motorcycle accident with the secretary on the yeah, back, whatever else. Yeah. But uh, he was rumored to go there. I think Lane Kiffin would have been a good hire to go there too as well. I agree. What about Josh Hope going to UCF? Uh, he was more former Missouri offensive coordinator. Uh, and being in the AAC conference, uh, yeah, UCF won't miss a beat. They, they, at least offensively, they should keep on humming. Exactly. You talk about offenses scoring a lot of points, but wait till you see this offense with this head coach score more points or they can't eclipse that. We don't know. And last but not least, what about Arizona State hiring Herm Edwards? Was this a good hire? 
Uh, it's going to be a good press conference. Going Herb's never uh, been shy to talk. He's always good for a quote. I think going to the college level, this might be good for Herm Harris. Now, you usually say that college coaches are not good for the NFL, and NFL coaches are not good for college. So it's either or. There's been some success in that category here and there, but I think Herm Edwards will be a good coach for Arizona State. He'll put together a good staff. Exactly. And he's old school. Old school thoroughbred coach. He ain't going to take no, nothing from nobody, and he gets it done. And he's going to get after you. He's going to get in your face. But overall, he can relate to the players. He builds trust. He builds relationship with players. And that's something that players want is relationship coming from where they come from, some of their backgrounds of not uh, n uh, not good neighborhoods and all this other stuff. But he can relate to that. And he can make winners out the players, and he's a motivator. And that's what they need. And I think this is a good hire. All right. Who are the coaches that are available deserve a coaching job? Uh, depends on what you mean by available. Uh, I mean, I think McElwain would be good if he goes back to another Mountain West school. Uh, he was, I believe, he was ten and two his last year at Colorado State. Uh, I, th I think he'd be good, you know, for a, you know possible coaching opening there. Um, I don't think Leach is going anywhere. I actually heard it's uh, possible that the uh, former uh, AD at Tennessee, John Curry, might be the next Washington State athletic director. Oddly enough. And, uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, th I think Lane Kiff is going to be back in the SEC within uh, a year or two. i say uh, <clears throat> Kevin Sumlin might have a job somewhere. And Jim Moore, he had a nice record at UCLA. He might get a job somewhere. I can see Jim Moore doing television. I, I, think, I think he's going to go TV at least for another year or two. What about Brett Belima, coach of Arkansas? He had a lot of success at Wisconsin. Then he took over the Arkansas job, didn't work out for him. So you see him back into Power 5 Conference? Uh, yes, but not as a head coach. Uh, before he took the Wisconsin job, he was a uh, Bill Snyder assistant at K-State. I could, uh, if uh, the, the rumors are true, where, uh, whether, whether uh, Bill comes back or his uh, son Sean takes over, I can see Bielema coming back as part of the coaching staff there. Okay. And the coaches that has to go. Uh, I'm gonna save mine for last, but who you think's gotta go? Uh, I mean, there's uh, it's just so hard to perform for some of these guys. It's a you know kind of a catch twenty two what they have to do to win there. Um, I, th I think Kansas is only paying to one coach now. So you look at Beatty, he's a uh, he's got to be the first one to come to mind there. Um, or Oregon State's already made their change. A uh, former Nebraska head coach, a former Oregon State head coach, uh, Mike Riley, he's uh, actually back as an assistant head coach. I think it's a great move for uh, both parties involved in that one. Um, it, it begins and ends with Beatty, though. Well, uh, King Clinsonberry, he's going to keep his job this year for getting that win and getting the bowl eligibility. But if he doesn't get players there to produce and get good quality wins, I can see him go. And Rich Rodriguez, eh, he might stay, he might go. But Lovey Smith, I can see him be gone in the middle of the season. Same with the Missouri coach, Brad Artem. I can see him going. Mark Stoops, he could be gone. They barely, no, not barely, but they got a couple wins to get in the boat. But I can see him be gone next year. And North Carolina, they had a tough break dealing with injuries. I mean, they were in some games, but... They lost close game as well, and Andrews didn't help his case. So I could see him keeping his job for now. If it doesn't work for next year, he might be out in the middle of the season. Boston College head coach, um, they got in the bowl, but how long is it going to be, though? How long is his tenure going to be there? Is they going to fire in the middle of the season next year if he doesn't get success? Or what's going to happen? I don't know. I'm going to cut to the chase. He's a nice guy. He's a likable guy. He's good people. He's a very good person. It hurts me to say this. I talked to him. And he's down to earth. And he signed my ball when I went to the function. At the Ramada Inn 
few years back at the hotel, Davy B has to go. I'm sorry that I'm saying this, but I'm being a realist. I am a diehard KU fan since birth, and you know I'm a diehard KU fan. And recent years, it is not been good. Because we once called ourselves a proud football team when we was winning. After Mark Mangino, then you had Turner Gill, that didn't work out. Then you had Charlie Wise, that didn't work out. And now you got David Beattie. I'm just like, when is it going to end? Oh, almost 10 years we haven't had a winning season. That is 10 and 65, I think. That is the laughing stock of college football. I mean, you got some people saying they should drop the program from Division One. I'm like, that is nonsense. It'll get there, but you just need the right coaching staff and the right coach to get players motivated and have some old school backgrounds. Three and thirty-three in three years, that's unacceptable. Would you keep a coach like that with a three and thirty-three record? I didn't think it was a great hire to begin with. I gave it a chance. But it's not another hire. I mean, you gotta hire somebody that is a winner, that has some old school background to him, or hire a protege underneath them with a successor that has the same similarities. Then you have the athletic rather to talking about uh, it takes time and other stuff. I get that. But we're not in the old days of football anymore. We're in the new football era. I'm going to compare this to. You could uh, try to bear with me here. Back in the day of football, when coaches were rebuilding, go recruit good players, players wanted to come to that university, make a change, make a difference, and help get that program back together. And winning was all that was mattered in rebuilding the program. It took time. And you can develop that. Fast forward to now. Players don't want to hear that anymore when you recruit them. All they want to do is go to school that is winning and possibly get drafted in the NFL. Now, he was mentioning that. We're going to do a remodeling of the stadium of $300 million. And you got $26 million indoor facilities and all that. That will get recruits. That's all good and fine. But that does not get recruits, really, in this day and age. Back in the day, when you used revenge stadiums and all that, I'm going to bring an example. With K-State, Bill Snyder, when he took over that job, when they revamped the stadium, did he or did not get good recruits and good players to come to that stadium? Mm-hmm. Like a lot of good JUCO transfers in there too. A lot of good walk-ons with the program there. But they uh, they, they, they had some kids come in there, yeah. Yeah, because they know what it took and what it took to recruit and what it took to revamp the stadium there and put a lot into it. As of now, you can't do that anymore. It's all about winning, winning, winning. Winning lives matter. Hashtag it. Tag it along on me on Twitter, tag it him along on Twitter, whatever. Winning lives matter in these DNAs because recruits don't want to hear that. Now, I'm going to bring this up. A couple of years ago, we had a chance to get an in state recruit who's from the city of Lawrence, Amani Tour, not Amani Tour, excuse me, Amani Bledsoe, four star defensive line, good player, balling out. It came down between Oklahoma and KU. When he looked at, he chose Oklahoma or KU, and look where he's playing at now. He's in the Big 12 championship, balling, got the win. He's in the college football playoff, and we're the laughing stock of the college football world. I mean, come on. you. When there's coaching carousel going on, you have to clean house. You have to join the party and clean house and start over. I mean, you gave him a contract extension after being Texas, so what? You can't use that as a formula to get players. I mean, nobody wants to come in there. Yeah, you beat Texas, but who else have you beaten since then? When does the winning come to a, come to a fault? Now, excuse me. When does winning come to a play? We 
have to start winning games to get recruits. Once you start winning, then you get your recruits to come in and play with you and develop and get more wins and get better recruitings as well. And with the contract buyout with them two, the athletic director and the head coach is $4.1 million. That's nothing compared to the other universities who have to pay $11 million for the coach buyout, $12 million for the coach buyout, so on and so on. They just need to find a coach that can relate to the players and get the best out of the players, have some old school background, and get the players playing the best to win games. That's what they had Mark Mangino. Ever since Mark Mangino's been gone, it just hasn't been the same. My opinion, it could be Manny Diaz, who I'm a big fan of. He could be a good coach. Kevin Sumlin, he has some going at Texas A&M, but they work out. He could be a good coach. You could get Mike Leach to buy out his contract. You can get so many people to coach for that university. You can have to stop being so cheap. Now, if I'm the president of University of Kansas, I'm having a one-on-one -on -one talk with the athletic director and the chancellor. Closed door in my office right now. This is what I would say. We are getting $300 million for fabrication on the stadium. We're getting $26 million in indoor facilities. What the hell is this? 3 and 33 the last three years? This is unacceptable. And I will say more stuff. Now I'm, like, I'm cutting to the chase right now. Either you do something about it or I'm going to do something about it. If I do something about it, you ain't going to like it. It may involve me your job. So go take care of it right now and get the hell out of my office. That's what I would say if I was the University of Kansas president. Because this is unacceptable. And we're the laughing stock of the football college world. And it has to stop at some point. When does the wins come in? I mean, you had chances to get good coaches because coaches are coming and going. Coming and going. Coming and going. Why not take the chance of getting a new coach? That's just my opinion, though. Mm -hmm. Would you do the same? Uh, yeah, I'd uh, try to go after uh, maybe uh, maybe one of the academy coaches. Uh, they all know all about that discipline and whatever else. Uh, you look at Army; they're eight and three. Uh, they beat Navy last year, going for two in a row against them, going to a bowl game for the second year in a row. Our, our Army can win ten games this year. He's the guy to have on my list. I also would have the coach from Memphis, who's got a contract extension. But I'll get like, what we got to do to buy you out? What we got to do to get you in here? Because he recruited some good players. I mean, there's a bunch of coaches that still are available. I'll go after the Florida coach who won the SEC championship. I'll get Brett Belima to try. Oh, Les Miles. He's an old school coach. Mm -hmm. I mean, he won a national championship with LSU. I'm like, what the hell's going on? So... If it doesn't go well in the next season, during the middle of the season, clean house. You have to stop the bleeding. You have to say, enough is enough. I'm putting my foot down. The athletic director is gone, and the head coach is gone. That's my take on it. And that will do it for that part of the segment. And when we come back, we're going to do predictions and matches for the Army versus Navy game. So don't go anywhere. Right here, only on... Game ball, college kickoff podcast where the football season never ends. College kickoff podcast where the football season never ends. Short and sweet, we're going to get into it. The prediction 
Uh, Army versus Navy. Who? Uh, what do you got? Uh, the only game, America's game. Army Navy. Uh, Navy's a three-point favorite. Uh, they started the season five and zero, oh, cracked the top twenty-five. Uh, lost three in a row. Had to withstand a furious comeback against SMU to hold them off 43-40. Have lost their last two games since. The last two games were against Notre Dame and Houston, though. Uh, th th those are two of their losses. They've also lost to Temple, Central Florida, and Memphis. These are uh, good, not great. Well, Central Florida, you can make the case, is great. Memphis offensively is great. Um, good, but not great teams that they've lost to. Haven't really gotten pancaked at all this year. Um, Army, on the other hand, they're 8-3. and three. Uh, had lost 14 in a row to Navy before beating them last year. Um, they've lost three games this year. Uh, I believe they lost, they're they actually coming on a losing streak as well. But they lost their last game against North Texas. They uh, they, they lost to Ohio State 38 to seven. Uh, not a surprise there. They uh, lost to Tulane as well, which is a little surprising there. Uh, Commander in Chief trophies up for grabs. Uh, Army beat Air Force. Uh, yeah, Army beat Air Force 21 nothing. Navy beat Air Force 48-45. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Army losing to Tulane. Navy beat Tulane. I mentioned Navy losing to Temple. Army beat Temple. There's there's a lot of variables here. Both teams are locked in to know what kind of bowl games are going to. Um, prior service, I'm a sailor floating the boats. Uh, Navy is the three-point favorite, but we do everything twice as better to Army. We're going to win by six. 27-21, Navy wins. Go midshipmen. Okay. Well, this is the battle of the triple option. Options basically their old school favorite fundamental. It'll be a fun game to watch. I'm excited to see, and it's gonna be a lot of points scored. It's gonna be to the final play. What defense makes enough stop and what offense scores enough points or get that final time to score a point to win that touchdown, either field goal or a touchdown to win that game. So I'm excited to see it. But I'm gonna go with Navy because Navy's been consistent. They keep scoring a lot of points and defenses keep getting better so I'm gonna roll with Navy to win this game also for Army and Navy it doesn't matter who wins or loses what matters is thank you for all you do for this country for your services whatever you do all of that you are home away from your family during these holiday times but hopefully you come back and see your family soon so thank you to the Army. You're welcome. Well, I'm going to get there for it. But I always want to say thank you to the men and women, Army, Navy, Air Force, who serve this country to protect our freedom, to do what they can. Hopefully you can be home soon, eventually your friends and family. And I have my partner with me who's also served in the Navy. So thank you, sir, for your services mm -hmm. as well and all that. Uh, that, uh, that will wrap up for game ball college kickoff podcast social media you can follow me at twitter game ball all capitalized as g a m b a l l underscore m y k e and we also have an official twitter page as well so that's capitalized at g c k underscore g n f l e instagram say excuse me instagram same thing G C K underscore G N F L E. That's all capitalized. Email G C K dot G N F L E at Gmail dot com. Facebook Game Ball College Kickoff slash Game Ball NFL End Zone. Twitter. You can follow us at G C K dot G N F L E TV. Your social media. Uh, Luke Hartnett on Instagram. Luke Hartnett on Facebook and at Luke Hartnett two on Twitter. I'm Michael Riley, and I'm Luke Hartnett. By saying, have a safe, blessed night, and be good. This is Game Ball College Kickoff Podcast, where the football season never ends. Peace. We are out. <laughs>